Welcome and good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Henry. I have the privilege of being Dean of the Stern School of Business here at NYU. And I'm thrilled to be with you here tonight for a very exciting program. It's my pleasure to introduce a member of our Stern family and author of the recent book. Here we have it. Tap, Unlocking the Mobile Economy, Professor Anita Ghosh, in conversation with Professor David Bell from the Wharton School. <laughs> and Nidno is a professor of information operations and management sciences and a professor of marketing here at Stern. He's also the director of the Masters of Science and Business Analytics program and the NEC faculty fellow. And Nidno's research analyzes the economic consequences of the internet on industries and markets transformed by its sheer technology infrastructure. He's worked on product reviews, reputation and rating systems, digital marketing, wearable technologies, and mobile commerce, amongst many other things throughout his illustrious career. And it's been quite a career. Anindu was recently named by Business Week as one of the top 40 professors under 40 worldwide. Congratulations both for being in the top 40 and for being under 40. <laughs> no longer, but <laughs> and by Analytics Week as one of the top 200 thought leaders in big data and business analytics. He has published more than 75 papers in premier scientific journals and peer-reviewed conferences and has given more than 200 talks internationally. Anindo has a BTech in engineering from the Regional Engineering College in Jalandhar and an MBA in finance, marketing, and systems from the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. He received both his MS and PhD from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Tonight, we're here to discuss his new book, again, TAP, Unlocking the Mobile Economy, which was published by MIT Press this past April. And as you'll see in the back, there are many copies of the book, so there'll be copies available afterwards. The book explores the transformational power of mobile technology and how the smartphone can become a personal concierge, not a stalker, in the mobile marketing revolution of smarter companies value-seeking consumers, and curated offers. It has been hailed as required reading for anyone who wants to understand how mobile technology is changing our businesses, our economies, and our lives. Joining Anindo this evening is David Bell. David is the Jin Mei Zhang and Yang Yi Dai Professor and Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School. Professor Bell is an expert in consumer shopping behavior, and his current research focuses on theories and explanations for geographic variation and the performance of internet retail startups. After the event, we hope that you'll join us to continue the conversation during reception and book signing with Anindo right here in this room. But at this time, without further ado, please allow me to hand the stage over and please give a big NYU Stern welcome to Professor Ghost and Professor Bell. Okay, so thank you very much for the, uh, the welcome, everybody. Thank you to Dean Henry for, for hosting the event. It's going to be a great event. We're going to spend the next uh, hour or so talking about the mobile economy with the world's foremost expert in the mobile economy. Um, I have a kind of an arc of questions that I was going to go through, and maybe we'll react to, to Aninja's answers. But also, we want to give you guys a chance not only to sample the book at the back, but also to ask uh, Aninja questions. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I've long been a fan of Aninja's work. I steal a lot of stuff from my own classes, with attribution, of course, at Warden. So uh, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's kick it off. So one of the things about being an academic is you can kind of work on anything that you like uh, to try and make an impact. So the first question, really, Aninja, is what got you into this... Uh, this whole world of mobile, what was it that got you excited? What, what got you started there? Sure. Um, well, let me first start by thanking you because, uh, you know, David's uh, probably the most sought after speaker I've ever known. And just for him to be here, he had to change a lot of things in his calendar. So, no, thank you for being here. Yeah, I'd normally be asleep right now. That's what he means. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a good question. I can, 20 years back in 1998, 99, I was uh, working in the industry. I was working for uh, initially Hewlett Packard and then IBM. And as essentially, this is just before the dot com boom, and I was selling e commerce solutions um, you know, to clients. And um, the internet was just about coming up. 
And you know, that got me thinking about you know, what is it that fundamentally consumers do that's different online versus how they behave offline. So I've sort of always followed my passion and interest in, in, on the internet. Mm -hmm. And as you know, you know, in the next 10 years, uh, by 2007 or 8, we started seeing this emergence of these smarter devices that essentially uh, you know, caused people to migrate from what was happening on the internet, on these desktops and laptops, to what was happening on smartphones and feature phones. And there was one quote in 2007 that really um, had me in split, and that was a phrase which said, we live in a world of smartphones and stupid people. Okay. <laughs> and you know, it was the first time I heard about that code, but I was in splits, and there's a part of me which was also naturally curious about what is it that's going to be different that people do on the smartphones compared to what they were doing on desktops mm -hmm. and laptops or in other devices online. That's really what got me thinking about uh, maybe there is some um, an interesting questions here in the in the yeah. world of mobile and yeah. that's how I Fantastic. Yeah, I mean the mobile device is certainly a pervasive thing. I think it's billions of them on the planet now, maybe four or five billion. Everybody's carrying one. People are constantly snacking on them all the time. So before we get into the uh, the real content and the kind of meat of your book, people always say the title of a book is really important. So it's kind of curious, you know, tap unlocking the mobile economy. Where, where did it come from? And uh, I thought the audience might like to know what was the number two title that you rejected in favor of that one. So. Yeah, so, uh, so the word tap actually has a double entendre, right? So tap has two meanings. The first meaning is, you know, we're always tapping on our phones, right? So in this world of smartphones and feature phones, you know, tap, 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 click, any action that you take is recorded as a tap. But the thing that's also exciting for me was you know, companies, every time we tap into our phones, there's a trail of data that's generated. And, and companies today can actually make a lot of meaningful use of that data. So companies can tap into the data that we are creating by tapping into our phones. Okay, so it's a two-way street. And that's essentially what the meaning of uh, the double entrant for tap was. Um, I did have, uh, you know, a second title, which mm -hmm. also included tap, but it was more like, I think, if I remember, uh, tapping the crystal screen, uh, you know how we say the crystal ball, um, but you know if you've had a chance to read the book and you have, right, the mobile phone can actually become a crystal ball for what we're going to be doing. Yeah. So I thought that, but I figured that uh, unlocking sounds much more Absolutely. sort of you know sexy. Yeah. So sort of with uh, with with that in mind, you know, why is it sort of a double barrel question here? Why, why is it that companies have found it really difficult, at least some of them? Um, to adapt to the reality of the mobile phone. I mean, clearly some new businesses that we all use, like Uber and Airbnb, yeah. are kind of built for the mobile phone. But in general, why have companies found it difficult? And have there been some sectors of the economy where companies have really taken advantage of what TAP can unlock for them? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. Um, so I think, you know, if I go back historically, um, I don't know how many of us know this, but you know, when I ask people when was the first smartphone introduced, and you know, most people will say the Apple iPhone in January 2007. But turns out that actually it wasn't the, really the case. The first smartphone, if you, you know, if you think of what a smartphone is, essentially sending email, receiving email, sending faxes, the first smartphone was introduced by IBM in 1992. Mm -hmm. That's a good 15 years before Apple's iPhone. Okay. Of course, it didn't have all of these features. It was called Simon. Okay. Now, uh, you know, for Simon, uh, IBM took six months to sell 50,000 units of Simon. In comparison, Apple's uh, sold 50,000 units in 14 days um, when the first thing just came out. So, uh, you know, there's a huge difference in adoption rates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to the question about why is it difficult for companies to uh, meaningfully adopt and, and monetize this, um, there's two, two reasons. One is, Fundamentally, we are spending more and more of our time on smartphones. Okay? Um, as of today, U.S. consumers spend about 198 minutes consuming media on a smartphone on a every day, on an average basis. That's actually more than how much time you spend on TV. You spend about 168 minutes on TV, mm -hmm. so we clearly surpassed that. Um, so adoption has been going up very fast, but companies haven't been uh, you know, at par in terms of monetizing their adoption rate. So a statistic that I'd like to share is we are getting about 25% of our information on a daily basis from smartphones, uh, so we're consuming media on smartphones, mm -hmm. but only 12% of ad money is being pumped by companies today, mm -hmm. which means that there's a 13% disconnect. In the U.S. alone, that's a $25 billion opportunity to be waiting to be monetized. Okay? And 
Uh, and my hope is, uh, you know, when some of us, uh, some of uh, the folks who get to read the book, is the f they realize how that can be monetized. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, so this is actually a perfect segue. So as you read in Ninja's book, one of the things that he articulates very nicely is this tension that he talks about between being a butler, so sort of understanding that, you know, you guys in the front there, you want to eat at a certain restaurant, you'd like to be served a certain kind of ad, or not being a stalker, you know, so when Bonnie comes into a hotel, maybe it's got a favorite food, it's got a favorite wine, but, you know, having a favorite TV show already on would be a little bit too much. So the sort of uh, disconnect between giving people what they want based on understanding of the data and then not being so overly intrusive that people are concerned about their privacy. So maybe you like to elaborate as yeah. why you chose that it's a great metaphor, you know, but not, not a stalker, and maybe a couple of examples around. Sure. Um, so about, you know, six or seven years back, um, I started working, my colleagues and I started working with some telecom providers, uh, you know, back in the Far East, so South Korean Telecom, China Mobile, and these guys. And, you know, when we first started looking at the data, and you, you know, you've seen similar data, it's incredible how rich it is and sort of how detailed it is in sort of capturing our behavior. And it was pretty soon apparent to us that you know, a company that's trying to monetize you know, user data, and that's essentially where telecom providers are getting today, right? So they realize that, you know, same with Verizon or AT&T, that there's only so much they can do with differentiating on products. Mm -hmm. you know, it's only so many different pricing plans you can have. So the focus now for Verizon and AT&T and the likes overseas is they want to take on the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. And if you ask Marnie Warlin, who's the CEO of Verizon, are you a telecom provider? And she'll say, no, we are an ad tech company. Okay? And even two years back, you wouldn't get the answer. So I realized very soon that the level, the detail of data is you know, supremely rich. And there's a very thin line dividing the cool things they can do versus the creepy things they can do. Right? Mm -hmm. So the last five or six years has been this constant experimentation by brands and marketers about where the line is. Okay? And the reason it's tough is because we, as human beings, are very heterogeneous in what we think is creepy versus cool. And so even if I take, you know, there are about 100 or so of us here, there's not going to be an easy, uh, you know, homogeneous line that divides the two. It's very different for each one of us, okay? And that's why brands and marketers are constantly experimenting that. Um, suppose I send you, you know, five offers today sitting here. Um, is that too much? Is that too little? And suppose I send you three offers. Is that too much or too little? It's because of the experimentation, it's very easy to deviate from being a butler and your concierge to becoming a stalker. Mm. And so sometimes when you cross that line, people feel over, overwhelmed with the level of you know, annoyance or intrusion and so on. But at the same time, and you know, I talk about in the book, so many examples of companies who are doing this remarkably well because they have figured out over the last five or six years where the line is and they would not do anything to jeopardize the relationship and the trust they have built with, with individuals. Okay? And it's actually not that difficult because really it's sort of a two-step formula. Okay? So uh, a lot of the companies I work with, what I've realized is if you follow the notice and consent formula, meaning notify consumers, make it transparent how their data is being used, and then seek consent, uh, you can actually become a concierge and, and, and your butler. Um, when you avoid that two-step formula, when you just do what you know what you can do without notifying consumers or seeking consent, mm -hmm. then you get into the stalker mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's actually from an execution perspective not that difficult. Oh. Um, so that's my hope that I think <laughs> when they read these case studies, they realize. Huh, you know what, we can do this too. Interesting. Yeah, and that actually is also a sort of perfect segue to the next thing that we're thinking about is, you know, as consumers on average, we're all fairly predictable. You know, if you look at my own behavior over a course of a year, you probably predict pretty accurately how much espresso I'm going to drink, how many days I'm going to go to the office. But then people are also very, very spontaneous. So in the moment, they kind of do things that's random. So there's another really interesting theme that a ninja explores, explores in the book, this kind of dichotomy between the predictability of behavior, which hopefully helps you be a butler, mm -hmm. uh, and the spontaneity, which maybe throws off your predictive model. So would you like to elaborate a little bit on that tension as well? Right. So a few years back, you know, we did a, some sort of a, a semi-informal survey of people, asking people, just almost in a room like this, that how many of you think you are uh, predictable in your behavior. And, and some of like 80% of the hands went up and said, no, we are very spontaneous. You know, we can't be predicted. Okay. So people will say that they are very spontaneous. However, the data suggests exactly the opposite. 
right? So when we work with these telecom providers who can essentially have you know, very minute data on where we are at a given point in time, and when you connect the dots, you like, John Doe repeats the same trajectory, right? 335 days of the year. Okay? The John Doe or Jane Doe is very, very predictable in where they'll be or what mm -hmm. they'll be doing. And so there's this dichotomy between what we think we are doing versus what we actually end up doing. Right. Okay? And in a lot of the examples I talk about this concept of a usual, right? Mm -hmm. So for most of us, there's a usual, you know, Monday to Friday, you wake up, and then before you go to office, you grab that Starbucks, you know, macchiato latte or whatever it is. And, and then you have the same sort of store where you go to, you have the same drink. For lunch, you know, you have three or four different spots to choose from. So even though we might think we are impulsive and spontaneous, for the most part, the data actually suggests we are very, very right. predictable. Which is why, like you said, it's actually possible and feasible for these companies to act like our concierge and butler. Because okay? if the butler knows your preferences and mm -hmm. concierge knows your preferences, he or she can tell you what to do. Right? Same idea. Fantastic. Okay, so I think this is a good time to kind of transition into the real meat of the book. So when you read the book, you'll see that um, and India has this really great elaboration where he goes through nine different forces that essentially drive your behavior in mobile. So you could be affected by a certain time or a certain location or a certain situational thing like being stuck in a, in a, in a subway. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll just kind of kick it off um, with that. So I'm going to take a quote from the book here on page 47, 48. Um, you lead with this idea of, of context and you say, context is the sum of all factors, circumstances and associated behaviors that guide decision making. And this is kind of the first force that uh, a ninja talks about. So maybe you'd like to kick us off by telling us a little bit more about what context is. And then I'm very interested always in, uh, in location, location data that comes off mobile. So then maybe that's another one of your forces you could tell us about location as well. Sure, sure. Um, in fact, my interest in location was actually triggered by your work. So David's done some phenomenal work with location-based uh, and economic <coughs> location. He has this great book. Uh, I'm going to have to buy him a beer now if anyone <laughs> buys one of those books. <laughs> actually talking about beer, so <laughs> let me explain the whole idea of context. So there was this one time, you know, when we were doing a study with some marketers and brands about, you know, sending people push coupons on their smartphones, okay? So here's what we did. Uh, on a regular working day on a Tuesday at 2 p.m., you've got folks walking down Fifth Avenue, as you know, you know, if you're from New York City, mm -hmm. lots of, you know, nice stores and restaurants and fashion stores and so on. So we send people at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday working day coupons for two kinds of coupons. One for Starbucks coffee, okay? I buy one cappuccino, get one free or whatever, 25% off on something. And for beer, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, buy one beer, get one free, okay? So, and we started looking at redemptions, you know, it's a pretty big study in thousands of folks. And, and if I were to ask you guys, it's Tuesday, it's a working day, 2 p.m., you're walking down, which one would you go for, right? Coffee or beer? Okay. I'm sure some of you will say beer, right? <laughs> but a lot of people essentially, as you can imagine, it was a working day. So people started, you know, rapidly redeeming this offer for Starbucks or coffee, okay? But then I changed, everything was the same. The same people, another Tuesday, another, you know, the only thing I changed was the time, from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m., mm -hmm. same location, same person, same day of the week, you know, nothing changes, mm -hmm. only the time changes. And suddenly, you see that the redemptions for Starbucks basically were minimal if it's zero, and redemption of beer mm. went up rapidly. Okay? So that's an example of context that you know, when marketers are trying to figure out our intent, they, they would want to get as many of these forces that I talk about, uh, information on these forces, so they know what might be the intent of this person, and so what kind of message would resonate mm -hmm. with them. Okay? So you need to know who your customer is, what he or she is doing there, you know, how did he end up there, all of these factors, okay. that's the context. Fantastic, so uh, again, you know, many of us probably engage with businesses on our mobile phones that take use of locational data, you know, ways and things like that, you know, basically knowing where all the density of phones are, it helps people figure out uh, traffic. So I know you have some pretty cool examples uh, in the book about location, so maybe you'd like to share a location-based uh, story about the mobile, and just, again, this is based on a ninja's research that I teach in my own class. Here's a really interesting thing for you. So let's say, again, I'll pick Bonnie since I can see her name there. Um, if Bonnie and I were about to go out for lunch tomorrow and look for a sushi restaurant and we search on a laptop um, and there's, we're going to more likely to go to a restaurant that's one mile away versus two versus three versus four. It's kind of a declining function of distance, everything else equal. What Aninja showed in his research is very interesting, is if we perform the same search, but not on a laptop, but on a mobile device, 
that function would actually get steeper and we'd become much more captive to things that were immediately local. So the fact that you've got this little guy in your pocket makes you much more attentive to things that are close. So this is one of the first papers that I read that a ninja published on this, but I thought it was a really fascinating insight. So I don't know if you want to elaborate on any other favorite location. Uh, yeah, good. I mean, you know, so this is one set of studies we did in Europe. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I take the example of Europe because, so having worked now in North America, Europe, Asia, and other parts of the world, you know, I realized that how consumers think about data and, and privacy is actually quite different. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the following sense, that it's in, in Europe, unlike in the US or Asia, you know, it's not market driven. Okay? There's a very strong sort of a, a governmental enforcement mm -hmm. on you know, what companies can do or without do. And so people essentially get trained in thinking that um, you know, sharing data is not a good thing. And there's a lot of restrictions on what they can do. So we did a few bunch of studies in Germany, one of the largest countries in Europe. This was pretty big, you know, 374 cities and towns in Germany. We worked with Telefonica, one of the two large telecom providers. And we partnered with 3,500 companies in Germany. So it was a long, long study over, um, you know, a big scale. And it turned out, and that's actually one of the contradictions that I talk about in my book is, people think and people say that they care a lot about data privacy, right? And you, people think that they want to hold on to the data. But when we explain the simple economics of, if you share your data, you're actually going to be getting money back in your pocket, right? The signs just flip. Basically, even in a country like Germany where people really feel strongly about sharing data, when they realize that sharing data is tantamount to getting all these discounts and offers and getting money back in your pocket and in your bank, right? All hands were on deck. Okay? And this, like I said, you know, this was pretty revealing to us because and, and the core part of this exercise was location. So all we asked people was keep your GPS on. Okay, when your smartphone is with you, don't turn off the location signal, keep it on. If you keep it on, we will send you offers based on where you are. Okay, so right now I'm like 100 feet away from Starbucks, and if I'm, you know, if I'm the right candidate, I'd get an offer. Okay. And that was sort of the tipping point for us when we realized that if in a, in a data conservative country like Germany, you can make this happen, then in other parts of the world where people are a little more flexible in the thinking, I mean, the floodgates are just about to be open. So. Fantastic. Okay, so we've uh, talked about North American results, we've talked about Europe, and if you guys are keeping track, we're now on to our third factor. We can't talk about all nine because, you know, you've got to get the book. So we've done context, okay, we've done location. Uh, one of my favorite studies that I love sharing with the students at, uh, at Wharton and other people I might talk to when a ninja's not around to do his own work on, on mobile is a study that he did in Asia that was really fascinating on the notion of crowdedness, how people behave. Like, we're in a reasonably crowded space, um, and does this contextual factor have anything to do with how you might respond to a mobile ad or how you might use your mobile device. So, an ninja, crowdedness. So, um, you know, typically crowdedness conjures all these negative perceptions and negative emotion, right? Most people, if not all of us, don't like to be in super crowded context, okay? Now, it turns out in the, in the marketing literature, so folks who have started, some of your colleagues have started retailing, they mm -hmm. have actually shown that crowdedness has a negative impact on offline sales and retail sales and so on. And then, you know, I, I was aware of some of the work that, you know, your colleagues have done, and I figured that um, it has to be the case that what we do in the offline world in sort of this crowded context does not necessarily translate into what we do when we actually have this little device with us, mm -hmm. okay? So how many of you take the New York City subway, or ever taken the subway, all right, okay? Now, what's the first thing that you do when you take the subway? Take the phone out? How many of you take the phone out, okay? I mean, if you just do a simple ethnographic study of subway commuters, right, um, everybody is bending down with the neck and they're tapping on the phone, right? So it turns out, and it's not just about New York City, the same story holds in Shanghai, in Tokyo, in you know, New Delhi, the rest of the world is very similar, right? On, the, on an average, you know, talking about this study, this is a study that we did in China. We partnered with uh, China Mobile and some of the local federal authorities in these cities in China that involved the subway authorities, the train transportation folks, and a consortium of several marketers. And we said that, look, in, in a context like a crowded subway train, if the first thing that people do is to take their phone out, if the average commute time for a commuter is about 25 minutes, which is what is mm -hmm. true in most parts of the world, it has to be the case that we can leverage that behavioral difference 
in what people do, and testing. So we wanted to test whether when people are surrounded by all these unfamiliar strangers in crowded context, is that a good time for a marketer to send you a message, or is that a terrible time? Yeah, so maybe, should we ask people, what, what do you think? Is it a good time or a bad time? Anyone want to throw out an answer? <coughs> bad time. OK, good. That's a, that's a good answer. All my questions are always 50-50, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> but good, I like the forceful answer, thanks. All right, awesome. but, but basically, even going in, I had the same intuition that it's a bad time. right? We found the exact opposite. We find that when people are commuting in these crowded you know, bus stations, train stations, subway stations, airports, it's the best time to send them an offer. An offer could be an email offer, it could be uh, an ad, mm -hmm. it could be a coupon, it could be a marketing message. And the reason it so happens is we, we ran several like, field experiments with people you know, leveraging the difference in crowdedness across train stations, across parts of the city. This mobile phone, when you're surrounded by strangers, right? Think about what we normally do, right? We don't like reach out to a stranger and say, hi, I'm an Indo, how's it going, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it doesn't happen anymore. We take the phone out, we immerse ourselves, the phone becomes our escape. Yeah. It stores 25 minutes when you have, as a marketer, you have the undivided attention of a potential prospective customer. Yeah. It's a great time to send them a message. And if you can cure it and personalize them, and that's what we saw, <laughs> that we saw upwards of 49% increases in mobile Redemption. So sales went up, you know, conversions went up, uh, responses went up, like on order magnitude more. And yeah. so that's where the crowdedness becomes an interesting, you know, content to effect. Yeah, no, it's it's. I don't think this is. <laughs> <laughs> sure. There's no exams. So. No, but I think this is the great thing about you know the research that a ninja does because we all have intuition about different. I actually had and sorry, is it out? Ian. Uh, Ian. I had the same intuition too that surely this is bad. It'll be distracting. But a ninja, you know, through controlled experimentation, careful statistical analysis, shows as more people come into the train, people turn inwards, and this immersion is actually positive. Okay, so that's that's our third factor. So let's go on to a uh, fourth one. We won't do nine. We'll do five, and then we'll let you guys ask and then just some questions. So. Another really fascinating um, force that a ninja or factor that he talks about among the nine um, is trajectory and social dynamics. So uh, what do we mean by social dynamics when it comes to mobile? And again, another great example would be good too. Okay. Yeah. So how many of us have seen the movie Minority Report? So you remember the scene where you know, uh, these companies would be looking into your eyes and based on your, the color of your eyes, they know exactly what you want, where you are, right? Mm -hmm. How many of us you think that that's science fiction? All right. So uh, basically, what I'm getting at is those kind of things are already happening. Okay? And so let me tell you a little bit of a small story about mm -hmm. these very interesting studies we've done with shopping malls in different parts of the world. Right. Now, many shopping malls and department stores they offer us free Wi-Fi. Okay. And the reason is because if it's a big mall or a big store, the the LTE 4G signal is not very strong, so we don't get access to the internet. But shoppers like to do mobile showrooming, meaning that when you're inside a brick and mortar store, you're still looking on your smartphone for, is there another online store that has a less expensive price or a less expensive mm -hmm. or a better product, right? So people like to be on the internet even while they're on their brick and mortar store. Okay? So that's why mm -hmm. you see you know, everybody offering you free Wi-Fi. So it turns out that one of the most you know, fascinating you know, futuristic, but yet not so futuristic trends is going to be that our friendly neighborhood, Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomingdale, Macy's, etc. when we get under the Wi-Fi, that Wi-Fi gives them instantaneous real-time information on precisely the latitude, longitude of what you're doing and where you are doing and, and how, how you're going about. Mm -hmm. So I have this phrase, uh, you know, I, I read this in the media and I often use it, the aisles have eyes. Okay? <laughs> and, and the reason is because with today's smartphone technology was well, the Apple iPhone 7, iPhone 7 and Samsung Galaxy that it's not possible for marketers and companies to pinpoint your exact latitude longitude within three feet with 97% accuracy. Meaning that you know, if I'm looking at that you know, very nice leather jacket, and I really like this jacket, <laughs> and I'm gonna ask you where you got it from, but if I figure out that I really like this jacket and maybe I'm about to go on my smartphone and look for a less expensive price than that mm -hmm. $1,000 price, the retailer through the Wi-Fi knows exactly what I'm doing and where I'm doing, and am I actually searching for these prices? So what they're able to do with Wi-Fi is that as we walk around in Macy's from the first floor to the fifth floor to the seventh floor to different parts of the same floor, they know what we're doing. Okay? And that's where this butler and stalker analogy is interesting because 
you know, you can do it in two ways. You can, at that time, you can, as you know the person's mind by following the trajectory, you can send them a highly curated and personalized offer saying that, you know, Anindo is just about interested in buying that really nice leather jacket, and the only offer we'll send him is for that jacket, okay? Mm. Or you can become that really annoying stalker and say, let me send him five different offers. I'm going to throw dots in the air, hoping that something will stick with Anindo, okay? And that's just a bad idea. The second option does not work. We've seen this time and again. So we tested these with massive field experiments in several shopping malls mm -hmm. uh, in, in different parts of the world. And it turns out that this trajectory, how we walk around and how we shop around, is a very powerful indicator of our eventual intent. Mm -hmm. So just before you buy, if you're able to actually leverage some of your prior behavior on the same, in the same shopping mall, mm -hmm. then you know, marketers can do remarkably well in figuring out what your intent is. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what trajectory comes in. Okay, okay fantastic. In fact, um, some of you are interested in retail, you might have read this book. It's kind of a classic sort of um, retail book called Why We Buy the Science of Shopping. There's a fellow Paco Underhill here in New York City. And what's interesting is what a ninja just described doing through technology. This is what this gentleman did sort of old school as an anthropologist would follow people like Ian around the store and notice if someone says good morning sir, you know, he's 10% more likely to buy. So he developed all these <laughs> rules of behavior and now a ninja's kind of doing the same thing but he's doing it from sort of a rigorous technology right. point of view. Yeah. And, and there's another thing actually just following yeah. up on that. Uh, you know, the same person behaves very differently when they're shopping alone mm -hmm. versus when they're shopping with family and friends, uh -huh. okay? And that's where the social okay. dynamics piece come in. So if people get onto the Wi-Fi network, now it's also possible for us to figure out, you know, if you and I have the same trajectory constantly in real time, we are right. going from the same store to the same store, we are the, taking the same breaks, there's a non-trivial likelihood we are together, right. okay? So, um, so we can start identifying if you're shopping as a couple, if you're shopping in a group, uh, groups of three or four and so on. And it turns out that you know, social psychologists had predicted like 50 years back that when we go shopping with our friends, um, when the same person goes shopping with friends versus family, that person is about to spend 15% more when they mm. shop with the friends versus family, okay? Your family knows your <laughs> net worth, you don't have to show them off anything, but you know, with the friends is always a little bit of, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, make, I, I make a good living. And now we can actually test this. So we also, the other force you mentioned with social dynamics is, you know, for the same people we are able to test when they were buying alone, shopping alone versus yeah. shopping with family and friends, and lo and behold, we showed that yes, you are going to be overspending or spending more when you shop with your uh, friends versus family. There are interesting differences in how you know demographics matter. One of the things that matters, we realize, is the richer you are, the more likely you are actually going to redeem coupons. Okay, this was actually fairly counterintuitive to us. And because, you know, mobile, uh, a lot of companies, you just say larger companies, there's this myth out there that mobile, uh, you know, bar mobile marketing is only good for these bargain hunters mm -hmm. and these stragglers. And, you know, uh, if you're wealthy and rich, you don't care about these discounts and offers. Actually, that's not true. Mm -hmm. From North America to Europe to Asia, we've seen consistently that as income goes up, your propensity to redeem discounts and offers also goes up. Mm -hmm. And this is consistent across devices. Uh, so that was another Fantastic. Thing. Okay, so that's a really good entree to the next question, which is going to be f uh, factor number five for you guys <laughs> keeping, uh, keeping track. So uh, in Philadelphia, there's a, well, I'll let Aninja explain the saying, but he talks about something in his book called the Wanamaker Puzzle. So I'll let Aninja explain the history of the Wanamaker yeah. Puzzle. Right. And then what Aninja does is he has a way of solving it by basically looking at, again, say, Bonnie or Ian, your behavior from one device to another, because that's obviously an interesting thing to figure out. What am I doing here versus on my laptop or on some other device? So, first of all, the puzzle, and how do you solve it with this cross-device? Okay. So, as you know, so Wanamaker's Red Bull has long history, and the yep. Wharton Solar business. Many of your colleagues have you know, solved, uh, theorized about it. So, the puzzle basically is uh, this was more relevant, sort of, in the offline world before the internet came in. That half of my advertisement money is wasted, but I don't know which half is wasted. Okay. That was the puzzle, that's the riddle. Mm. So for 50 years or maybe longer, you know, marketers have sort of abided by that rule and says half of my ad money is going to be wasted, I just don't know which half. Turns out that today, in 2017, we actually know that. Uh, and the reason we know that is because of all this you know, increased targeting, increased accuracy, increased tracking, increased monitoring that companies can now do. So we, um, and, and so in, in this today's world, you know, as we browse the internet, as many of us 
probably have done this, we have multiple devices. You know, we have smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktops. So for a number of years, it was actually technically very difficult for companies to know if David right now is on his smartphone mm -hmm. versus an hour from now when you go back, maybe you're on your tablet, another couple of hours you'll be on your laptop mm -hmm. at home and so on. <coughs> but in 2017, in May, right, we know this. So um, you know, with varying levels of accuracy, um, sometimes going up to 90%, you know when the same person is shopping or browsing on a smartphone versus a tablet versus a desktop versus mm -hmm. some other device. And that's what helping us solve this puzzle. Okay? So um, what really got us thinking about this was this interesting conundrum that Alibaba, and, and a company in China, that posed to us and said, look, you know, we have all these shoppers. And sometimes they come to us on the internet. Sometimes they come through a mobile app. Sometimes they're on their tablet. And we are trying to figure out if knowing that information can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And we said, of course, I mean, you know, you can do so much more. I mean, you're going to be solving, uh, you know, a lot of headaches for a lot of advertisers. So we actually worked with them for a couple of years, between 2014 and 16. And, and we had this paper where we showed that essentially the introduction of tablets has been a great boost to mobile commerce. So when the same person is using a tablet and a smartphone at different points in time, mm -hmm. he or she is likely to buy a lot more from you hmm. versus when the same person is using a smartphone and a desktop. So in some ways, the desktop and the smartphone become substitutes, and the smartphone hmm. and the tablet become complements. Okay? Hmm. And so if you really want to sort of incentivize these people to buy more from you and get their attention, you got to reach out to them when they have the tablet. Hmm. Uh, and assuming they have the smartphone, now we can trace that. Because if you can reach out to them and delight them on the tablet, they are going to end up buying a hmm. lot more on the smartphone. Okay? Wow. Um, and so there was this nice, and so that's where, you know, an example of how you can solve this in a one maker's riddle and say, look, I know uh, where to put my ad money in. Mm -hmm. okay? If I'm trying to create these synergies between smartphones and tablets, I need to put my ad money in these devices, mm -hmm. not in my desktop or mm -hmm. and so on. Now, this is really fascinating. It actually reminds me of something I read recently. Uh, I think a fellow at Boston College showed that when you're on your, you know, laptop versus on a tablet, the mere fact that you're touching things uh, makes you more likely to buy them. It's kind of this endowment effect. Well, I right. touched that glass or that pair of jeans because it's a haptic yeah. sensation, right? It's kind of crazy. So I do want to turn it over to you guys in a second. So I'm just going to ask Aninja uh, one more question, and then if anyone from the audience wants to address it either to, me, to Aninja through me or just okay. directly, that's fine. Um, so one thing that's great in the book is Aninja gives us really historical perspective, like who knew about the Simon, right, from 1992? <laughs> and then he bookends, at the end of the book, he talks a little bit about what the future might be like in terms of the Internet of Things and mobile technology and sort of next gen is the phrase you use. So right. you want to prognosticate a little bit and tell us a little bit about the so future, is, your next book, I guess. <laughs> uh, this is when I tell people, brace for impact. <laughs> because if you think mobile is creepy, then you've seen nothing yet because we, is, we are so, it's going to get so much more fascinating, at least for me, um, and maybe a little bit, uh, you know, worrying for some of us. Um, so, so there's a lot of things I can say, but, you know, here's the way a few things that I've done and I've seen talking with mm. companies is, uh, you know, sticking with the world of ads and marketing. And I'll give you another example with healthcare. You know, yeah. one sort of creepy, maybe one cool, right? right. So um, we are not going to be that. We are not that far away from a world where, you know, when you go back home on, on you know, Saturday night, you've just had a great time with your friends, you know, out uh, in a restaurant or in a club, and you go back home, switch on the TV. A lot of people like to, you know, do a little bit of TV watching before they crash. Um, and you see an ad, that ad is going to be customized in real time based on who you are, where you were, and what you're thinking. Okay? So this ecosystem is already being built by some of the same companies that I mentioned. And, and I'll give you a simple example how this will happen. If you have an Apple smartwatch, if you have an Apple phone, and you have Apple TV, okay, it's relatively trivial now to make this happen. Okay? The Apple smartwatch emits your biometric data through the in-house Wi-Fi through your smartphone, which is talking with the Apple TV. So the folks behind the ecosystem know that an Indra has just come back on Saturday night at 2 a.m. You know, he's had like half a dozen drinks. He's, he's almost <laughs> wasted. Okay? Don't, show him, don't show me an ad for Grey Goose Vodka. That's not the right time. I just had six of those, right? <laughs> Show me something that's going to calm me down, sober me down, put me to sleep, like that nice Caribbean beach vacation. Okay. <laughs> so this ecosystem is already being built. And um, essentially, you know, what this is going to entail is this 
two-way street of consumers coming forward and saying, here's my information, and then companies you know, using that, not abusing it, but using that. Mm -hmm. okay? So that's sort of a retail example. Yep. The other is in healthcare, and this is something that we are now working with hospitals, where we're looking at, you know, if you take, on an average, a hospital cares about two metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one is, what is the engagement time between patients and doctors and nurses? Mm -hmm. You want to maximize that? And what is the waiting time for patients in a, in a ward or in an ER, right, before you get admitted? You want to minimize that, okay? What we are doing now with wearable devices is, you know, we are instrumenting uh, patients, doctors, nurses, they're all wearing the wearable device, and when you wear the device, uh, it's constantly telling us your walking trajectories within hospitals, and we are figuring out the hotspots of inefficiency. Mm. You know, where are all these nurses and doctors clustering, and can we minimize that inefficiency? In a, on an average, for the doctor or the nurse to walk to the patient is about two and a half minute walk. If you can shave off, you know, 45 seconds mm -hmm. of that, by distributing the information, we can do so much better, mm. right? I mean, healthcare costs will come down dramatically, but at the, the but the core of this exercise is still that creepy, you know, or cool <laughs> tracking of data from your wearable device. Okay, and and the reason I'm saying this is because while there are many commercial applications of this monitoring or tracking technology, there's also some really sort of you know life changing yeah. implications. Yes. Yeah. No, I think this is great. And I think you can see just through uh, Aninja's answers and the way he's kind of articulating his book, the great thing about this book is you do have this framework in your head. When the new stuff starts to happen, you say, oh, that's factor five, that's factor four, that's factor three. So I think you know, whenever you read one of these business books, it's really great when there's kind of a framework that it's not just understanding what's happened, but you can kind of look forward to that. So I did promise exactly uh, at 10 that if anyone from the floor wanted to ask an injury question before we break for, well, I guess we'll have to go with uh, Bonnie and Ian since they were on the spot, and then we'll go to the gentleman there to, to Alan, and we'll go to the back too. So, Alan, you want to kick, uh, Ian, you want to kick us off? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, thank you. It seems uh, fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Uh, we live in an era when regulations are being relaxed, I think mm -hmm. is the verb that's being used in the media. Um, what are your thoughts then both about uh, about this creepiness factor mm -hmm. that if if my if my watch and my phone and my my tablet is able to gather a massive amount of information about me that I may not actually want you to have access to uh, what kind of policies do we actually need in place and if we're going to have a predatory government that we seem to have uh, what can I do to protect myself if sure, if right. yeah. so uh, yeah. Thanks. Great question. It's one of my favorite topics. And you know, let me th just start by giving you an anecdote. You know how uh, last month the FCC um, rule made, came up with a ruling that ISPs no longer need to seek our permission to sell and share our data? Now, if I take a survey here and say how many of you hate it, I think every hand will go up. <laughs> I argue, argue in the book, actually that's a good thing. Okay? And let me give you some examples why, right? So first of all, the common concern for a lot of people is I am getting overwhelmed with ads and offers and messages and information, right? And the reason it's happening today is even though it might seem astonishing, companies don't have sufficient data about individual consumer preferences to stitch a profile. And so what they're doing is that's why they're throwing 10 dots in the air hoping that something will stick with you. So we are constantly getting bombarded by emails, ads, coupons, and offers because they don't have this profile stitched together. Okay? One of the things that I've argued in the book based on the work on the project that I've done is that when consumers come forward and say, here's my information, specifically here's my preferences for food or healthcare or banking, we've seen that the relevancy of ads goes up and the frequency of ads goes down. So rather than them bombarding you with redundant and irrelevant ads, they're now going to reach you only once or twice in a month and they're going to send you a very relevant offer. But to make that ecosystem work, both parties have to like come forward. You know, companies have to promise, the onus is on them as well. They have to promise that they won't abuse your, the trust that you're giving them. And, and I talk about examples where you know, we've been able to make that happen by keeping in mind this notice and consent formula. And then when that's happened, consumers have been delightfully surprised and pleasantly uh, you know, overjoyed because they saw, wow, I'm no longer being you know, bombarded by these irrelevant offers. Okay? So in the top, coming back to this whole ISP thing, what's going to happen is there's going to be a market for privacy. Okay? 
So your, your friendly neighborhood Comcast or Time Warner says it's $100 a month for you, uh, you know, if you uh, default opt-in. However, if you don't want us to share your data, sell your data, you got to pay us 125 okay? So you pay a premium. I'm just making the numbers. But we are going to see this market for privacy that's going to uh, come, and this is going to actually force them to increase transparency. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because when, you, when you're going to actually partake in this bargaining and negotiation, you have to be more transparent, otherwise the ecosystem doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so people will self-select. Those of us who are comfortable with information or reconciled to this, we'll pay at the low price. Those of us who want to protect it, you have to pay 10% more. Um, and so this is how, and I talked about my book, the ecosystem will evolve. Cool. So I essentially I'm saying that I don't necessarily see the bad thing. <laughs> He's always a bit of a contrarian. Th thanks, Ian. <laughs> thanks for the question. There was a, a lady over the back had a question too. My question was actually sort of related. Thank you. Um, my, my question was actually sort of related, and I was wondering um, if you're familiar with any consumer research that's been done regarding this. Um, I'm mm -hmm. the kind of person who has my smartphone in one hand, my laptop on my lap, and a landline on the other. <laughs> I'm like multitasking all the time, and, and I find it really offensive um, uh, because a, a lot of times I buy, say, a gift for a person, right, and I don't have any intention of ever buying that gift again mm -hmm. but I'm constantly bombarded yeah. with and and it's, and it's just I, I get to the point where I decide I won't shop at those places sure, anymore. Sure, yeah. It's the same problem so like you know what uh, Ian you yeah. said essentially the reason you know you're getting bombarded or retargeted with those irrelevant and redundant ads is that by now, you imagine they would have known that you just bought that pair of, you know, Jimmy Choo shoes, very expensive shoes. You're not in the market in the next month or two, right? I wish that's what I bought. <laughs> 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 so, you know, they should know that you've already done this, but what's happening in parallel in the ad tech world is, you know, we have newer technologies that are automating this buying and setting of ads. And what's missing in the puzzle that has not been done yet as, as, as well is the stitching together of the consumer profile. So as the consumer actually, and, and I'll give an example, one of the companies that does it really well is Facebook. So Facebook, since about a year and a half or so back, has started giving consumers on Facebook an option of telling them, do you find this ad relevant or is it completely relevant? And some of you may have seen this, you, know, you can check off some boxes, and essentially that's their first step towards trying to elicit what is it that you really care about? And those of us who actually give the feedback back to Facebook, you will, for a fact, start seeing lower frequency of ad exposures and more relevancy. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, then we'll continue to be bombarded by this, you know, irrelevant, irrelevant ads. So um, it's, I don't know what the right timeline is, is it two years or three years, but the ecosystem that we are moving to is one where some consumers and recognizing this problem and hoping after they read the book <laughs> would see this, that there is a win-win that you can create. Great. Uh, thanks, you're great. So, uh, Ellen, you were going to ask a question. Yes, yes. Um, then, thank you both. I just, wanted, uh, I just wanted to ask a question about the finding that more wealthy uh, customers are more likely to use right. coupons. Now, is this merely a reflection of the fact that more wealthy consumers have more disposable income are more likely to make a purchase, and the less wealthy people are not purchasing it, or is it that the less wealthy people are simply buying the same items and somehow couldn't quite right. use the coupon? Great question. No, absolutely. So you know, there were many factors that we had to consider. One is, is it more likely that the more wealthier people actually have smartphones and tablets, and that's why they're able to receive mm -hmm. these offers? Is it more likely that they just purchase more often and that's why they will buy it anyway? So we had to look at these incremental effects of targeted mobile ads to come up with a convincing story that these are additional sales that would not have happened if these people were not sent these offers. And that's where these field experiments come in. We have test groups and control groups and try to ascertain causally that this really is a causal effect. And a part of the reason also was that, you know, Typically, higher income or more wealthy people have more transactions over time, and so we have more information about their preferences. Right? So how, the way these machine learning algorithms work is, you know, if, you, if you take the same algorithm and feed it 10 data points versus 100 data points, it's going to train itself much better the larger the data. Okay? 
And so what really helped us also ascertaining this causal effect was for as the income went up, we had more of the historical transactions and more of the information. That also helped us train the algorithms better, which we can then use to randomize you know, these coupons and so on. But after controlling for all of this, we essentially found that uh, after controlling for device usage and income, that you know, wealthier people are more likely. But it's very important for us to send them low frequency and high relevancy messages. Mm -hmm. That was important, okay? uh, because they have shorter attention spans, you know, the information overloaded. So you send them one offer in a shopping mall trade, it better be the most relevant one. Mm -hmm. And when we did that, that's when the redemptions went Fantastic. out. Fantastic. OK, I guess we'll, we'll do a couple more. And the, the, the lady there, yeah? And then we will, he'll be available so one on one, I guess, right? For, sure, for just sure. questions. Because I think, do we have a hard stop at seven? Or go a minute or two? OK, all right. So we'll do the lady there. Yeah, please. So I found, a, my found, I saw, I found myself in an interesting position. So I recently, well, about a year or two, I cut the cord on cable. And I realized uh -huh. that there are a lot of advertisements I don't receive anymore. Uh -huh. And yeah. now it's like I get it by word of mouth. Like, really? That changed? Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're selling those now? And I'm, I'm wondering if retailers are finding it more challenging to get their products out there as more and more people cut the cord on cable and regular TV. Mm. I mean, I think to some extent, you know, it's been a challenge for them, surely. But one of the other behavioral changes we have seen is that while well, you know, I don't know if it's true with you, but a lot of people who cut the cord yet actually go and watch TV on the device, okay? And so what's happened is we've seen fundamentally that for marketers, while the space on television shrunk because you're not on there anymore, but they can now reach you on your smartphone, okay? mm -hmm. Because you're spending more time on a smartphone, okay? And that opens up a new window or a newer window for them to start establishing that mutually beneficial trustworthy relationship, okay? And there are a handful of them who are you know, learning through the ropes by parsing your preferences and reaching out to you with you know, more relevant and less redundant messages. But a lot of them have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So you know, if I am Macy's or if I am Bloomingdale or if I am you know, I don't know, Target, um, what I would like to know is you know, when my customer cut the card, which of the other devices are you spending more time on? I mean, there must be some device from which you're getting your media. Okay? Is it the laptop? Is it the tablet? Is it the desktop? Is it the smartphone? <coughs> Once I know the answer to that, then I can start, again, curating my messages and follow you and your preferences on these other channels. That's why that tech makes the one amica riddle actually become solvable now, because uh, it's not possible for companies to figure out, when you cut the cord, where did you go to? Fantastic. Okay. I think we'll go to the gentleman at the back, and then we might end on Bonnie. I don't want to. We, we may have more time. We'll see. Okay. okay. Please. Yeah. Hi, Professor Ghost. My Hi. name is Rishi. Nice to finally meet you. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, with the evolution of autonomous cars, so they're not going to be driving. They're going to be in the back, or they're going to be in the front. They're going to be mm -hmm. on their smartphone. So it's going to be very similar experience to when you're on the subway. Yeah. So what is the opportunity for marketers to market to those people? when there's an average of maybe 30 minutes or an hour yeah. on their commute? You know, that's a great question. Uh, when, I, when I teach the class that you know, we'll be in, this in a few weeks, I ask people, why did Google start investing in self-driving cars? It's a search engine company, right? And so it's an, it's an interesting conversation to start because you know, it doesn't immediately occur to a lot of people, it didn't occur to me either, that the real reason Google wanted to do self-driving cars is because when the cars are self-driving, you're sitting idle for 45 minutes, you're mm -hmm. going to be opening your laptop or smartphone, that's a great time for them to reach out to you with all these offers, right? <laughs> so that's a real reason. And it's the same idea with, with the subways, right? So what we're able to monetize in China, South Korea, because you know, over there, the subways are 24 hours. There's no dead spots there. You always have the internet. you know. And we were able to see the evidence that for the 25 minute commute that the average person had in Shanghai or Seoul, uh, once you're able to curate these offers, the responses and the reciprocity, the relationship was phenomenally different and better. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's absolutely that evidence. So I think you know, uh, that's what's going to happen. So. Fantastic. Yeah, very interesting question. OK, Bonnie, you want to do your last question to close us out? Sure. Yeah. So I've seen some very effective you know, mobile um, advertising offers. But I'm curious from your point of view, 
um, if you think there are any marketers who are doing it really well, um, particularly outside of retail. I think one of the great examples was um, the con uh, case that won for Tesco in Asia, mm -hmm. where while you were waiting in the subway, you used your phone to order the groceries, right, and, right. and mm -hmm. it was delivered by the time you got home. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that was a real winner. But um, are there any examples that you've come across of marketers who've done a really good job at um, monetizing the mobile space? Right. Yeah, so, you know, uh, think about a company like Coke, right? Coca-Cola is a consumer packaged goods company, right? I mean, you, two years back, Coke came up with a vision called 2020. This is Coke's 2020 vision. And what they're doing right now is, and this was surprising to me and astonishing in some ways, they are ascertaining for each of their, uh, I forget the number, seven, 75 million uh, customers mm -hmm. in the database. They are pinpointing this pro profile and narrowing down the preferences of each of their customers, okay? And what they're gonna doing is, and there's actually a nice video about this, that you know, when, 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 uh, when Mary is in Paris and she and her boyfriend, her boyfriend plays soccer every Tuesday and Friday at 2 p.m., he goes from his home on his scooter uh, to that football stadium in Paris and she's behind him to support him and root for him in the stadium. Coke now knows the exact trajectory that Mary and uh, you know, JP take in Paris. And now they wanna reach out to JP and Mary in the trajectory that they're taking and send them a message that is relevant, okay? Now, you would think about like, why would somebody buy, uh, you know, get a customized message for Coke? At the end of the day, it's still that. What Coke is also doing is taking fluctuations in weather patterns and dynamically changing pricing for you. So you, Mary and, and, and JP might get a very different price for the same can of Coke in Paris at, on Fridays at 2 p.m., whereas, you know, since you're very wealthy, you're gonna get a much higher price. So, that's already happening. Okay. Um, and again, uh, the reason I talk about this example is, you know, people normally don't think that when I buy this bottle of water that I actually get a different price, right, from the vending machine. Mm -hmm. But there are firms that are already doing this. So the vending machine has a camera, you know, they recognize an Indos come in, you know, he's a bad customer, I'm gonna give him a high price. And Dave is a good <laughs> customer, okay. So these things are already in place. And what's, you know, what's in the works is, how do customers adopt to these new changing social norms, okay? Um, and in some countries, we see that the uh, adoption rate is rapid. Uh, people care about the economics of it. And in some countries, you will see it's not as rapid. Fantastic. All right, so I think you want to squeeze in one more? Yeah, please, let's do one more. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, thank you. No problem. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to touch not on ads, but on the user engagement because yeah. there are over 2 million apps already. Yeah. Uh, people really download a lot of apps, they don't use mm. most of them. Have you ever done any studies uh, on user engagement of what are usually the best tactics that you consider? Yeah, uh, so you know, one of the things we did was uh, we worked with uh, you know, several hundred thousand <coughs> apps from the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. And the whole idea was to figure out like what are the features of these products that can be monetized. Okay? And so this goes back to one of the questions mm -hmm. David asked, which is that there is a 13% disconnect between the fact that we are spending 25% of our time on smartphones and these apps, but only 12% of ad money is being pumped in. So it turns out that you can actually, you know, using these predictive models, come up with pretty specific answers. And uh, for example, one of the things we realize is for the same person, Let's say you know you are a Saks Fifth Avenue customer. Okay, you have their mobile, you have a smartphone. You're often browsing on their website. At the point in time when I see that you've downloaded the app for Saks Fifth Avenue from the Apple Store or the Google Play Store, that's an excellent proxy. When my model is saying you are turning loyal to Saks Fifth Avenue, the mere act of having to go to the Play Store and downloading the app and the effort that you put in might seem trivial. But behaviorally, it's very predictive of when you've just become a loyal customer for Saks Fifth Avenue, okay? And Saks Fifth at that time should try everything it could to, del to delight you and surprise you and really keep you happy, okay? And that's a very tangible data point that they have. They know exactly when you downloaded the app, right? And so these are the kind of, you know, aggregate level analysis we were able to do. We could also, like, look at within app how you should design these features and so on. Okay, fantastic. So I think on that note, first of all, thanks to everyone for coming along and listening, and thanks to Amanda. Thank you.